Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to session three. I'm Laura Fernandez, the executive director of the Summer Academy to Inspire Learning program. I am co-moderating along with Peter Laufer. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much and welcome to all of you. I'm Peter Laufer. I'm the James Wallace Chair Professor in Journalism at the School of Journalism and Communication here at the University of Oregon coming to you pixelated. And we have a great time ahead for you today. We're glad you are with us. We're going to hear from Zach DeMars, from Julia Mueller, from Aaron Sandbold, and from Alexander Haar. And would each of you just say a word of introduction? And we might as well take you in the order that we just heard. So Zach DeMars, who the heck are you and why are you here? Well, I have the same question every single day. My name is Zach. I'm a senior here uh, at the University of Oregon studying journalism and political science. Uh, and today I'm gonna be talking about my research, which was uh, from 1960 to now, beginning a pen pal project between Oregon and Russia. It is going to be fascinating, I can guarantee you. And so with this, Julia Mueller, who are you? Why are you here? My name is Julia Mueller. I'm also a senior at the UVO, and I'm here to present my uh, research, my thesis project with the Clark Honors College on uh, journalistic guidelines for the representation of women in written news. And no jokes will follow that that would be inappropriate. Now, Erin Sandvold, welcome, and let's hear from you. We will find you and then we will hear from you. But I there know you go. I'm here. <laughs> oh, there you are. Good. I'm here. Love technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Erin Sandvold. I'm a senior at UO. I'm an English uh, major and a digital humanities minor. Um, I'm also, also one of the um, Oregon Humanities Research, uh, research Fellows uh, this year, along with Alexander. And my project this year is uh, titled Murderess in the Headlines, and I'll be looking at a case study of Belle Gunness, a serial murderer from the early 20th century. And speaking of headlines, that's a great headline, <laughs> and we look forward to hearing that. Alexander Haar, hello to you, and what is going on? Uh, not much. Um, I'm Alex. I'm a junior at the in at UO, obviously, um, in the SOJC and studying political science, uh, like Zach. Um, and like Aaron, I'm in part of the her Humanities Undergrad Research Fellowship, and I'm presenting on Rajneesh Purim and um, a case study of how sensationalism is ingrained into the way media operates. It is going to be a fascinating time. And let's start by traveling back in time to 1960 with Zach DeMars, taking a swig of something out of that canister. You're on, Zach. It's something. All right, well, let me share my screen here. I'll do the old Zoom, is this working? Uh, all right, so. Uh, as I said, my name is Zach. I'm a senior here studying journalism and political science. And today I'm going to talk about one very small part of a much larger project that I had the pleasure of being a part of. There were a number of people who were involved in this project. You can see all of them uh, down below here. You can also see some of them in the panel here. Uh, Dr. Lawfer and uh, Julia Mueller were huge pieces of this project. So my uh, appreciation and gratitude goes out to them. But um, I'm going to be talking about from 1960 to now, beginning a pen pal program between Oregon and Russia. Um, to start, let's go straight to Moscow. Uh, so this is a monument in Bolotnaya Square in Moscow, Russia, on the Moskva River. Uh, this was taken um, on the very last night of my research and the last night of my reporting for this project. I was there in Russia uh, looking at this monument, among many other things. And the name of this monument is kind of the one big thing that I think I took away from all of this research, that children are the victims of adult vices. So this monument here, you've got these children blindfolded playing in this square. Uh, they seem to have not a fear in the world, but all around them are there these 13 dark, uh, frightening statues which represent these various adult vices. So you can see uh, indifference is the tall one in the back there, irresponsible science, there's ignorance, 
uh, elsewhere, propaganda of violence. So these very adult things are kind of peering down into these children who are none the wiser. So if you take nothing else away from uh, what I'm gonna be sharing with you, I think this is the main lesson of what we learned. And it was kind of serendipitous uh, that this was the very last night of my reporting uh, when I was on the ground in Russia. So your obvious question is probably, why were you reporting in Russia? How did you get there and what is going on? So uh, let's go back to 1960. Uh, in 1960, in Roseburg, Oregon, uh, a group of fourth graders, a class of fourth graders, wanted to be pen pals with peers in Russia. And this was, of course, the Cold War. So the State Department was not a particularly huge fan of this idea. And they denied that class's request to help them become pen pals with their friends in Russia. This made the headlines. Uh, it made the news at the time because it was uh, seen as a little bit silly, a little bit extreme by the State Department to deny this request for pen pals, very simple seeming thing. Um, and so it made the news, it was a big deal. Um, 60 years later, which is to say last year, uh, a reporting class, I was in that class, it was taught by Dr. Lawfer. Um, we discovered this story and we set out to tell the story of this uh, small moment in time 60 years ago, this connection between Oregon and Russia and the parallels that it has with the relationships that our two countries have today. And so we set out to fully tell this story and ask if it would be any different today. Um, we kind of had two tasks. I think any good reporter has two main tasks when they're looking at a story or looking at a topic. On the one hand, we had to craft an accurate retelling of what happened. So this was very historical. Um, it's hard to rely on people's memories because this was 60 years ago. So people's memories have a lot of holes. So we had to use a different, uh, a bunch of different tools to understand how this went down in 1960 in this small town in Oregon. So we uh, used government documents, we used newspaper clippings, we used testimony from people who were there, memories from other people, all sorts of things that the journalist, the normal journalist will use in uh, coming to conclusions and understanding uh, what happened in history. But then I think another important task is to connect uh, a reporter's work to the present moment. And so this is why I ended up in Russia. Obviously, there are a lot of interesting parallels or interesting uh, kind of tangential relationships between the US and Russia today since the Cold War um, with presidential election meddling, um, all of these sorts of things that uh, make the relationship between the two countries challenging kind of spring out of uh, the Cold War. And so my goal with this work was to uh, complete the accurate retelling of this story uh, and complete the book that we eventually wrote as a class uh, by connecting it to the present moment. So we asked these kind of two main questions. What would have happened if the US State Department would have said, yes, uh, you can be pen pals with friends in Russia? And what would happen if we tried again today with these uh, new dynamics, but still similar dynamics? So. Uh, to accomplish this, we had some students in Yonkala, Oregon, which is just outside of Roseburg, uh, write letters to their new friends or what would, they would hope would be their new friends in Russia. And they shared, of course, all of the things that kids do. They talked about school. They talked about their family. They talked about their state. This was, uh, this was one of my favorites. Our state is most famous for Nike. The most famous people that come from here are Marcus Mariota. It is sunny and rainy. I think that's just lovely uh, memories of Oregon. Um, so we got these letters from these Oregon students talking about Marcus Mariota and the sun and the rain in Oregon, and we brought them uh, to Rostov-on-Don, Russia. So if you are of the geographic camp that believes that uh, the border between Europe and Asia is on the Don River, this city is a city in two continents. So you can see where it is on the map there. This is Gymnasium 14 on the left. This is the school uh, that I had the pleasure of going to, speaking with the students and bringing them these letters. Um, what they did, as kids do, they responded. They wrote letters back to our students here in Oregon, and they wrote about um, many of the same things. None of them did mention Marcus Mariota, but they did mention all sorts of other sports, the weather, their classes, their families, um, how they didn't like math, how they liked uh, to play, how they like to swim, all these sorts of things. Uh, some included drawings like this lovely gerbil, I think. Um, 
And so then this was kind of the what would happen today part of this story. And um, we see that these kids, they do exactly what they would have done in 1960. They talk with their newfound friends um, as any kids do. One of the other really important parts about being there though were the teachers that were there because um, some of the teachers had graduated from the school in the Soviet Union when it was uh, still part of the Soviet Union. And so they could kind of remember what would have happened if that had been the case. One of them called it a game of adults. I thought this was really interesting um, because he said that they, if they had been asked to you know, send letters to American friends uh, in in the Cold War, they might have included some, you know, Soviet comments, but it wouldn't have been heartfelt. They would have uh, included it just to satisfy the game of the of adults, um, but not so much out of true belief. They would have been more focused on the smaller human aspects. Um, another teacher, Tatiana, she's now the principal at Gymnasium 14. She said propaganda in the United States was also propaganda against the Soviet Union. And she told a really interesting anecdote about when uh, she met an American and it was this American's first time ever meeting someone from the Soviet Union. And he was astounded that she was uh, a normal human being, as she put it, uh, because he had been taught uh, by propaganda from American media or American government that uh, people in the Soviet Union were other or different. Um, so this is the part of research where researchers try and draw some conclusions about what they have found. This is not particularly profound. I don't think it's surprising that children want to talk about things that children want to talk about and that they don't care so much about talking about politics and that maybe there was some propaganda against uh, the two countries, uh, the two major powers in the Cold War. And I think uh, the kind of lack of profundity is exactly why it matters because I think it's something that we often forget um, that there is this, huge disconnect, as some of the students and teachers I talked to put it, there's a disconnect between the government of a people and the people themselves. Um, and I think this was really seen uh, in what the students wrote about, what they were interested in, and what the students who were there at the time remembered. Um, I'll leave with this uh, lengthy quote from the artist of the uh, uh, monument that we saw at the beginning. For many years, it was affirmed and pathetically explained, children are our future. However, to list the crimes of today's society against children would need volumes. It's not too late for sensible and honest people to think about it. Do not be indifferent, fight, and do everything to save the future of Russia, and I might argue the future of our generations. Thank you, Jack DeMars, and, and uh, I look forward to the question section to learn more and to share more with the others and those watching later what it is you experienced and the research you and and the rest of the class did i just have one footnote for those watching listening and participating and that is the book that you've mentioned repeatedly is before publishers now and we the class that we have named janice 101 look forward to sharing that with all of you once it's published and also participatory, or though not here today to talk about that directly in what occurred in Janus 101 is Julia Mueller. And welcome to the Undergraduate Research Symposium again to talk about your research into the guidelines for the representation of women in written news. Julia. That's exactly right. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, let me get my screen up. So uh, my research with the Clark Honors College is just that. It's about guidelines for representation of women in written news. Uh, my project analyzes current industry standards of style guidelines related to the representation of women um, in the context of psychological and linguistic research on how language and gender interplay, and then how that applies specifically to the very public facing communications world of journalism. So what I did was I did an analysis of the psychological and linguistic research, and then I did an analysis in light of that on um, industry standard style guides. And then I applied that to the results of a survey that I circulated um, with journalists in the Pacific Northwest. So 
the questions that my thesis see seeks or sought to answer is how are industry standard journalistic style guidelines lacking with regard to the representation or the portrayal of women and how can they become more comprehensive and then at the end, based on the responses from the participants of the survey, I propose some areas and aspects of language and reporting that I think should be incorporated and addressed by industry standard style guides. So uh, language is at the root of all that we do, uh, and it shapes and is shaped by society, culture, religion, and politics. We're still speaking uh, English that harkens back to Old English 1500 years ago. And so, you know, given that, there's no question that despite progress that we as a society or cultures have made, that there's still embedded in the language these kind of longstanding issues of patriarchy and hierarchy uh, and power, because language is really a power dynamic. The people who have the ability to kind of determine, especially when in the light of this particular project, when you're considering grammar and style, the people who have historically had the ability to dictate that and regulate it and put it into dictionaries and style guides and encyclopedias and what have you are the people who are the dominant groups at the time. Those are the people who are able to decide what language is proper and because of that, it kind of disadvantages people who don't have a say in deciding what is or is not proper language. Those are usually groups of richer people, educated people, and they're usually white and have historically been usually male. Um, and this kind of deciding what is proper and what's not proper has led to um, this kind of rejection of what is often called tortured constructions of language. Uh, and for example, like spokespeople, which we might commonly use today to describe a, spokes, a spokesman or a spokeswoman, but collectively, um, was once considered a tortured construction of the word spokesman, which was just there to describe usually a man who is speaking. Um, and this tortured construction idea kind of shows this fidelity that we have in the English language to tradition without really seeking to update that and kind of address culture with the language that we regulate. So um, language and communications are important and the focus of this thesis is journalism specifically because it's one of the largest forums for language uh, dealing not only with communication but with public facing communication which is an important distinction and it's um, a particularly a form of language and communication that actively seeks to be read and to be consumed by as many people as possible on a 24 seven basis. And so the language that's used in journalism becomes particularly important and particularly influential. Um, so in my thesis, I narrowed the focus of these industry standard style guidelines to the Associated Press style book because it was used, as you can see, overwhelmingly by survey participants. Um, and I also chose it because it has some flaws right now, uh, at least flaws as I have perceived it, having read uh, the relevant literature, because the treatment of women, uh, as I examined it, is relatively short and vague, even when compared to other style books that do exist in the industry but aren't as widely used. We have two examples here from the main sections in the style book that do deal with the treatment of women and the treatment of uh, the representation of women and it says treatment of the sexes should be even-handed and free of assumptions and stereotypes which is a little bit vague because it doesn't really go into detail about what those assumptions and stereotypes are and then there's another section that says language around gender is evolving newsrooms and organizations outside ap may need to make decisions based on necessity and audience on terms that differ from or are not covered by the AP specific recommendations. And this has kind of received some flack because um, the AP has historically been criticized for, again, having this kind of fidelity to the way things are usually said um, or the way that um, has been historically proper, but also uh, a real deference to changing your language based off of where you're reporting to, which in some cases is necessary to be able to connect to people. But in some cases, you're, you know, not using trans inclusive language, um, because you're worried that that's going to offend your specific audience. Um, 
So of the survey responses, I uh, reached out to over a thousand journalists in the Pacific Northwest and I got a full 88 responses back. Um, they were predominantly from Oregon, uh, although quite a significant number from Washington, and then a few from Idaho, British Columbia, and Northern California. And then there was a relatively even split of male to female, although I think it's important that no one reported being non-binary, so the perspectives can be limited in that regard. Most of the people surveyed were reporters, followed closely by editors. On the left, there's kind of a breakdown of it. Editors and chief copy editors, but 33% were editors and um, about half were reporters, just to kind of orient the results later. And the first thing that I did was to assess, ask respondents to assess their own experience with guidelines in their newsroom. So 51% of the people that were that responded to the survey had newsroom style guidelines that addressed gender. Uh, but I think it's notable that a lot of people for all these answers were unsure. So 23% were totally unaware of whether or not their newsrooms even had guidelines related to um, fair treatment of the sexes in writing. 20% felt or were unsure if their newsroom reports differently on women than on men. 55% had no gender specific style guidelines and 40% disagreed or were unsure if their newsrooms prepare them to write without gendered stereotypes. So even though AP, which all of them used, says writing should be free from stereotypes, 40% were unsure or they disagreed that they were prepared to actually do that, which I think is interesting and kind of informs what um, moving forward. The second section, asked respondents to list aspects of writing, grammar, or reporting that they found to be fair or unfair to women. Uh, some said that this was absolutely not the case, and I've got some examples of those here. Uh, a copy editor from Oregon said, done correctly, no aspect of writing, grammar, or reporting treats anyone unfairly. Objectivity is the backbone of good community-based journalism. And another said, good writers treat everyone fairly, or at least try to. Um, but what I'm going to show you next is uh, some groupings of the responses that people gave um, that they did voice concerns about different aspects of the writing that they felt were unaddressed. So I think it's important to note that some people do believe that um, they're doing well or that their newsrooms are doing well. There were a lot of factors that respondents discussed related to, um, you know, my, my newsroom is all women, so I think that we do a good job of being aware of this issue. But because of so, so many people did voice concerns, I feel safe in concluding that even if some newsrooms are doing well, changes to the guidelines would benefit those newsrooms that don't feel that they're doing well or don't feel prepared. So um, the rest of the responses can kind of be grouped into um, five categories. And these were when I asked them both about aspects of writing and about suggestions for changes to the guidelines. And I'll just go through them really briefly, but these were the main categories of issues of sexist writing that appeared both in their responses and in that psychological and linguistic research. So we have things like addresses. So this issue of um, Mrs. versus Ms. prioritizing women's marital status, uh, using female as a noun. So this female, uh, just blanket stating that in the in the writing. Um, and then the issue of male normalcy, which is a little bit more um, complex, but you've probably read it even if you didn't have a term for it, but it's these terms that we use that normalize the idea of men as the main version of particularly professions, um, but it can apply to several different areas of language, but the main suggestions, or sorry, um, examples are things like lady doctor, female scientist, woman senator, whereas we wouldn't write male doctor, male scientist, man senator, um, to kind of, and these kinds of, um, qualifications of, um, of womanhood uh, make it clear that the norm is for a man to hold that position. So it can apply to a couple different areas of language, but the main issue that was brought up in the context of reporting is how often that's used um, to qualify professions. Now we've got character, character descriptions. Um, there's a lot of research into how people value certain adjectives or descriptions. And so we have words that are associated with women like shrill, which is really negative, and sweet, which is really positive. 
and uh, the converse for men. So um, sweet is not valued for men. And then we've got male coded words like powerful and aggressive that aren't valued as much for a um, female subject in a story. There was also the issue of examples and sources, which was brought up several times. And this is more of a broad scale reporting issue as opposed to specifically language, um, but the issue of finding women sources. One of the respondents said, I think interviewing expert women on every topic tends to be harder than finding men to comment on topics. And there's two reasons um, that are kind of circulated for this. Could be because women uh, don't hold as many positions of power or could be an issue of an internal bias um, trying to reach out to male sources for an issue. So I think even though it's a broader reporting issue, examples and sources is also something crucial to incorporate in uh, style reporting guideline to consider, even if it's not possible to get a female source, but to consider whether it is possible to get one. And then finally, selective portrayal, which is a term I coined because I wasn't sure what else to call it. Um, but it's the idea of a reporter's personal choice on how to represent a woman in terms of um, the story elements that are included in an article written about a female subject. So these are things like physical descriptions. We see these, this kind of unevenness a lot in I think election cycles of um, women's dress or physical appearance being discussed more than the male counterpart. Mention of um, wifehood or motherhood, whenever it wouldn't be relevant to the story or wouldn't be included in a story about a man. Uh, exceptionalism, which is the idea of, oh look, a, a woman is doing the thing. Wow. Um, descriptions of her attitude, which goes back to like shrill or whether she was open, these kind of qualitative analyses of uh, how she's being represented and um, attire, which goes into physical descriptions. So um, then I asked people to kind of categorize suggestions for changes to the style guidelines. And there were a lot and I'm not going to go through them all. But uh, I think that in support of my idea that something comprehensive and more instructive needs to be added to the style guidelines uh, were these two quotes. The guidelines could become more comprehensive with more discussion about subtle gendered language beyond the obvious and more thorough explanation of what gendered words mean. And I think that across all of this, uh, you know, AP itself has identified some issues. They address a little bit male normalcy. They address addresses in some regard. But I think that the main concern is that they're addressed in these kind of broad sweeping terms, like the original entry I read, which is avoid stereotypes and assumptions without more thorough explanation of what those stereotypes are, what those assumptions might be, and how they might be applied to different areas of language, like character descriptions and physical descriptions. And then other people mentioned issues like women in leadership, industry and newsroom practices, like trainings, and societal perceptions, which are all much bigger issues than can be addressed by the AP style book. So in conclusion, um, I, think, I think that there's some um, concern about whether or not uh, it is the place of the AP style book to address these social issues. Um, but I think that striving toward a language that's free from bias and free from stereotypes isn't taking a political stance, but rather attempting to make language catch up to the world that it's describing. Thank you very much, Julia Mueller. And it leads so ideally into, <clears throat> excuse me, the headline that Erin Sandvold has chosen for her research project, which is intriguingly murderous, murderous in the headlines. So perhaps you want to say a word about the yes. headlines? As yes. Yes. Definitely, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this one. All right, so um, Murder Us in the Headlines is my title for this project. Um, I have been a true crime fan for pretty much my whole life, uh, make assumptions about what you will. Um, but I was actually just really intrigued with being able to look at true crime with this kind of academic lens, which it's usually not given. Um, so I approached this topic while working in the basement of the library in our um, 
imaging services where the Oregon Digital Newspaper Program is taking place. We're digitizing small town newspapers and it's actually part of a wider nationwide effort to do this with Chronicling America for the Library of Congress. Um, as I was just quality checking images, making sure that they scanned properly, I came across this article and was just like flabbergasted because I was like, I know this person. I know this story. And this is an Oregon newspaper that was published in Portland. And this is about a week or two after the events were discovered in Indiana where the events actually took place. And I just found that fascinating that it literally went viral, um, you know, to use our modern cadence. Um, it was literally a nationwide sensation and there was several other like female murderers at this time that were also making headlines like this. And so I was really intrigued of what fascinated them at the time about these people and what fascinates us now to constantly keep telling these stories again. Um, so I was mostly struck by, once I started my research, how many different versions of the story were out there, how many people were telling these narratives. Um, so on the left here, we have a couple of the books that I engaged with. You'll notice the top two are the same that were released at two different times during the 20th century. Um, and on the right are all the different podcast logos. These are only just a handful of the podcasts that I used um, really to kind of bring in a modern perspective of how we're telling stories right now because podcasting is this really huge new medium that people haven't really gotten into yet. And so with every single one of these narratives, a new bell was created. There is a different kind of story being told. And so to start examining what those were, I turned to Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, who wrote this book called Monster Theory. And in it, he posits that monsters in society are cultural creations. We have created these monsters out of our own fears and anxieties. And monsters give us an ability and a chance to read those fears and anxieties back at us um, in order to kind of see what's scary about them. You know, we, we have to break down the monster. Why are they monstrous? Uh, and a quote that I found really useful, um, he, so he posits seven different theses. And his third one is that the monster is the harbinger of category crisis. And a quote that I found really helpful to kind of break that down uh, is the two precise laws of nature as set forth by science are gleefully violated in the freakish compilation of the monster's body. A mixed category, the monster resists any classification built on hierarchy or a merely binary opposition, demanding instead a system allowing polyphony, mixed response, difference in sameness, repulsion and attraction, and resistance to integration. And I found that a really useful quote when examining gender anxiety, because gender even today, we're, we're finding a hard fit to fit into a binary. We don't want a binary. And things that fit outside of it scare us, and they tend to be you know, conceived as monstrous. Um, and also this kind of line of the repulsion and attraction, uh, that there's always the, that car wreck. Everyone wants to go stare at the train wrecks and the car crashes. And so I think kind of coming to that when discussing the story was really important. You know, Human nature wants us to keep going back to these stories. And so what is the story? Uh, I'm not going to do this justice. This is going to be a quick rundown of this woman who is a very complicated person. This postcard, which uh, a lot of these historical images I will show are actual postcards that were sold as souvenirs uh, at the auction of uh, her farm after the discovery of her crimes. Um, so who was Belle? Uh, Belle Gunnis was a Norwegian immigrant who came over in the 1880s. Uh, she married at 25. Uh, this photo on the left is her wedding photo. She is so happy, you can see. Uh, she was later uh, lived in Chicago with that first husband. They had several different children, none of which were probably hers. We believe they were all fosters. Um, that first husband died conveniently on the day two life insurance policies were overlapping. Uh, she took that money and moved off to Laporte, Indiana, where she purchased this farm. Uh, this is a reproduction of the photo in Laporte. Again, this is another postcard. Um, and this was like an artistic reproduction of what the farm looked like before the events of April 28th. Um, on April 28th, the farm burned to the ground. Uh, there was nothing left. Uh, this happened about four in the morning and it wasn't until later in the afternoon that neighbors were able to approach the building and start digging through the remains in order to find the inhabitants of the home. Uh, so content warning here, it's gonna get a little gross. Um, in the basement, there was the three children and a headless woman uh, found, and they were trying to figure out if it was Belle or not, and no one could ever, and to this day, we don't know if it was Belle in the fire or not, and so that adds to the mystery of, we don't know if she got away with all of this or not. Um, part of her big story, too, 
is she was luring men to this farm through matrimonial ads. Um, and that's what she's most famous for. So she was luring men with ads to come to the farm, join their fortunes, and you know, she'd get the money and then she'd murder them. Uh, her last victim had a brother who came to Laporte and insisted that they search the farm. And that's when they started discovering the bodies. Um, this is the pig pen where nine of bodies were found. I believe there's 14 bodies found on the farm uh, during that time. And then uh, Bell was later given numbers up into the 40s of people that, you know, just died in her presence and people were just like, it's her fault. Um, but this was huge then. This is, these are pictures of the crowds that came to the farm after the bodies were discovered. The barn was converted into a morgue and these are people lined up to go see the bodies of decomposing victims that were dismembered in body bags. <laughs> Um, and these are well-dressed people too. You can really see there's, there, everyone's in their Sunday best. Uh, train cars were added to trains to get people to Laporte to be able to see this. And a particular favorite photo of mine is this one where you see these women and children picnicking in the lawn outside of the ruins of this farm. And so with this, I was really seeing, Belle was being created into a monster of like a monster sideshow freak. Um, that was really the push for this. You know, she was this aggressive, independent woman farming by herself, taking care of herself and asking men, you know, to come be her husband. You know, it's just, she was very aggressive in that way. And so she was constructed as a monster in that way. But towards the mid-century, that changes a little bit. With Lillian Della Torre's book, she put, so this is in 1955, and this is a very different bell than we saw just previously as the butcher. Um, Lillian kind of redresses Belle as the femme fatale, and we get this kind of Black Widow narrative going on with her hair, the makeup, the obvious cleavage. Her overt sexuality is very pushed here, and so we get Belle turning into this femme fatale, and we can see that in the 50s, gender anxieties were about women's agency and overt sexuality, and so we can kind of see a, compar a parallel uh, among that. This book was interestingly later re, uh, republished in 2016, and there's a vast difference in the way that Bell's being constructed. And I found that particularly interesting that in our modern era, uh, we have the subtitle of true crime. It's the true story of the notorious serial killer, as opposed to the other one. If you look at the very top little words, it says men swarmed like flies to her embrace. And so we have very dis disparate kind of narratives being uh, assumed with these different books. Um, and then quickly, podcasts, because you can't, can't do it without listening to a little podcast. So I have a really short clip from My Favorite Murder, if anyone knows MFM. These are wonderful ladies. There's going to be a lot of laughter. I promise they're not laughing at victims or murderers. This is part of what we're kind of seeing with the construction of these narratives um, and how they're being changed in our modern, modern era. So this is a clip of Karen Kilgareth, one of the hosts, and she is reading one of the matrimonial ads. Uh, that Bell published. Comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided hmm. with view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow, answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. I don't want no scrubs. And a bachelor side of the best friend It's best friend's farm. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to burn down a horse. <laughs> burn down a horse. <laughs> she tried to burn that horse. <laughs> Triflers need not apply. Is our next shirt. Oh my. <laughs> So yeah, so there's, you know, we have this, this personal ad that comes out and we have this woman in 1908 saying triflers need not apply to her personal ad. And we can't help but think in our modern era of like, yes, girl, get it. Like ask for what you want. And I think we have this disparity in our brain of how do we reconcile this horrific murderer, but also this kind of icon of feminism in our modern take of it. Um, and to show the influence of these women and this podcast on society, uh, this is just an Etsy search for triflers. Uh, people have been creating a bunch of content. So again, we're uh, creating profits and profiteering off of this woman's murders. We had postcards previously. Now we have cross stitches and stickers. And uh, the Stay Sexy, Don't Get Murdered is the My Favorite Murder like tagline that they end their podcast on. And it's just really taking over. And it's this, this kind of build of women's anger kind of turning into like a positive feminist movement. 
and Belle's really a part of that because I think she just can be reinvented in so many ways. Um, and lastly, thesis two of Cohen to bring it back to the monster theory. Um, the monster always escapes and that's why we can kind of keep coming back to them and reinventing them because we never know where they went and they can always come back in different reiterations. And with Belle in particular, it's this really interesting, we have all the way up into the 30s, people claiming that they've seen Belle, that they swear it's her neighbor, they swear that this is the person. Um, and she gets kind of lumped in with all these other really big Chicago murderers. If people are familiar with H.H. H. Holmes at all, she gets really tied in with that kind of narrative of this you know, the murder farm, the murder factories, it's just pretty, pretty intense. And I think uh, we just keep coming back to that. And I think it's really interesting that we use these murderers to kind of examine our own fears and anxieties throughout time. And it changes because the monsters are always different. It's not necessarily the murderer. Um, and yeah, just want to thank Kerf and all of my professors and everything in the English department. And thank you, Aaron Sandfold. That is a fascinating follow-up to the representation of women in written news. And from there, we jump to Alexander Har and a piece that, as I understand it, is pre-recorded and will roll now. Uh, yeah. Um, Jessica, did you want me to share that or? Uh, I've got it. Okay. And I explained in the video, but I just basically want to do a pre-recorded session because I'm a terrible orator. I just get really lost in my head and then I get nervous too. Um, and I really wanted this to work out. So uh, I just did a pre-recorded version. Sorry, is it a play? Jessica, we're missing the audio. All right, just one second. Thank you. Rajneesh Param's interactions with the media. We can use Rajneesh Param to gain insight to gain insight into how other controversial groups and figures are represented in the media. And specifically, we can use Rajneesh Param as a case study to understand the methods of attracting news attention and news coverage. So you're probably wondering, what does Boris Johnson have in common with the Rajneesh movement? Why is he here? And it comes back to media. Both Johnson and the leaders of Rajneesh Param were able to mobilize sensationalism within the news to affect independent outcomes. Take Johnson, for example. Would you believe me if I told you he enjoys painting model buses? Probably not. It seems odd and specific, and that's exactly what he depends on. Now when you search Boris Johnson and bus, you'll see him talk about his new hobby rather than him alongside his red Brexit campaign bus, which happened to have false statements about Brexit on it. And with one interview, he's able to turn a fun hobby into political cover and bury the Brexit bus in the Google search pages. So who exactly were the Raj niche? The group is often classified as a cult. But as the word cult itself has become a tainted term, I usually refrain from applying it to Rajneesh Perum and typically refer to the group as a commune or religious movement. Rajneeshis, also called sannyasins, were followers of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan and his followers established the city of Rajneesh Perum in Waso County, housing 15,000 people at its peak. Rajneesh membership was largely white, professionally skilled, and upper middle class, giving the commune an upper hand in legal disputes, printing, and publishing capacities. Bhagwan practiced and taught a new type of spirituality, one that placed sex as an essential act to enlightenment and achieving a higher level of consciousness. Because of this, Bhagwan became known as the sex guru. Bhagwan claimed Rajneeshism was the first religion to fully synthesize religion and capitalism. And they were constantly in the media's attention. Who led the Rajneesh? 
If you've seen Netflix's Wild Wild Country, you know there's a split between leadership. On one hand, you have Ma Na Sheila, Bhagwan's right-hand woman and second-in-command, dealing with day-to-day operation, administering the ranch, and dealing with the media. But then you have the founder and one of the main foundations of Rajneesh Bhagwan still sending the ideology and giving sermons. But there's a point where Bhagwan takes a vow and Sheila's control became, becomes total. Part of what makes Rajneesh Param so hard to talk about is because it's hard to tell what is real, what is legitimate, uh, versus what is more propaganda, and versus what's more loosely fact-based, or based on loose facts. Um, and part of this also because of how much media Rajneesh Param was able to put out itself. Uh, Rajneesh Param had a large publishing wing of its own. Uh, they were able to publish a daily newspaper, had a large publishing arm that printed books, booklets, postcards, stationery, and sold tapes of Bhagwan sermons. And basically, they just spread Rajneeshism throughout the entire world. Uh, these are just some pictures from uh, Rajneesh Param. There are... To the left is um, Sheila with Bhagwan, assume, I, assuming Bhagwan in the car, driving one of his Rolls Royces. Uh, another fun fact is he had 94 Rolls. Bhagwan had 94 Rolls Royces. Um, this picture is just an aerial photo of um, the camp, so you get a real sense of it. It was really a, it was a whole town, um, and it's important to understand that it is a town as it comes with the town capacities. Uh, this is just AR in a car and the Rajneesh, a picture of the Rajneesh Times. Uh, all right, gaining news media for uh, gaining news media for advertising. Um, one of the strategies used by Rajneesh Param was using the media, basically uh, the news media specifically, as a way uh, to get advertising. In the words of Mana Sheila. No publicity is bad. With one word like bullshit, I have the press running after me. I get free advertisements. I sell billions of dollars to my corporations. We don't have to advertise. Some of the strategies used to gain that free news media coverage were uh, include managing, organize, managing the organization to maximize conflicts, applying sensationalism, engaging the largest stakeholder, largest stakeholder possible, and using coverage to leverage support. And so... Um, this just has a law on it right now, this whole slide, I know. Um, but let's just take this one quote. Um, the whole state is full of idiots, she said. The Oregonians are full of prejudice. They are fanatic and torment the people. It is the same as before when Hitler established a whole army to persecute the Jews. And basically, this is getting at um, Sheila's strategy. So you insult the entirety of Oregon, the, or the Oregonians. Oops. And then um, you compare it to Hitler. Probably the worst comparison you can make. And then it becomes news value through uh, the mechanics of news coverage um, because it is relevant to a large population. And this is just a quote from one of the lead reporters uh, from the New Republic on the Rajneesh. Uh, the Rajneesh do not want to be left alone. They are a conflict-oriented group, and they want, above all else, to be in the eye of public controversy. Where there is no conflict, they create it. Where there is conflict, they already escalate it. Where there is conflict already, they escalate it. Um, and so this is kind of part of their strategy, their organ both the organizational strategy of how they are going to manage their organization, but also how they're going to manage their communication for their organization. This is where sensationalism starts to play a big role. So in order to gain the extra news coverage, Sheila was intentionally sensational as possible. Um, and using George Durgin's I define sensationalism using George Durgin's definition of sensationalism as an emphasis on personality, preference over the trivial, over significant news, and use of colloquial personal language. So Sheila is purposely trying to emulate these values in order to gain news coverage. And we can see her um, use an effective uh, use of personal language in this interview. Bigger is quite happy to be a pimp. And I don't, I beg your pardon. I said your godlike figure is happy to be I beg your a pardon. Pimp. Whoever you happen to be. Well, is he a pimp or is he not? You know, you're a worthless man. You must know pimps because you must be going to prostitute yourself and must be in touch with pimps. And so um, she strikes 
she strikes back and uh, basically she shuts him down using this personal language uh, which then could possibly pick, be picked up by even more news media because it is such inflammatory and personal language and it's so open and visible and this really played into Sheila's second strategy which is insult everybody Sheila used insults as a common way of engaging relevant media stakeholders i.e. audiences so basically how news coverage works is um, Usually local channels will have uh, their people who watch it. So their audiences are stakeholders within the news. They have some vested interest or for some reason to watch this news. Uh, and the news media should reflect that by covering what's important to this constituency. Uh, and following this logic, uh, Sheila basically made herself, imp made herself newsworthy through insulting enough people. Uh, through insulting enough people, uh, she increased her chances of coverage increased her relevancy to new stakeholders, basically for media attention. And if we go back to um, this other slide, we can see it uh, being used, uh, Mother Teresa, uh, pr ugly and Australian prune faces, Oregonians are full of prejudice, non rajishi children look retarded. Uh, it's obviously, uh, she her language is part of her personality, possibly, but it's also part of a larger strategy of insulting people to get that media coverage. Finally, come back to the question of why does Rajneesh Puram matter? What's its significance? And in short, its significance is actually the news media's faults. Rajneesh Puram exposes how the news media can be used as a conduit for advertising and enacting an independent agenda. Some other key takeaways from Rajneesh Puram include the media is ill-equipped to deal with controversial and divisive groups. Sensationalism is ingrained in our news cycle, and the news media can be hijacked for outside purposes. And as I take this research further, um, some possible future links could include um, possibly how the, how does the NRA manage conflict? How do other controversial po political figures uh, manage conflict? And what is the role and what should be the role of news media? And lastly, how can we fairly report on controversial groups. Thank you for listening, and I'd also like to thank some other people as well. Um, the first and foremost, I'd like to thank the University Special Collections. Without them, none of this would have been possible. Um, I would have even really known about Rajneesh Parham at all. Uh, and special thanks to Linda Long and Dr. Judith Raskin uh, for helping me start this project, and to Professor Dean Mundy and Carl Reesner for helping me, advising me, and just <laughs> motivating me, honestly, <laughs> through this long process. Um, thank you all. And, and thank you all. These have all been, uh, as uh, we knew they would be, just fascinating presentations. And we have some time now for questions. And I don't know how much time we have for questions. Laura, do you know what our time frame is? And I'm not hearing you, Laura. I think you must be moved. 3 p.m. Pardon? Three. We have until three p.m. Ah, oh, terrific. Okay. Thirty-five minutes. Oh, that's that is uh, that is time that we will spend well. So, I I have a question to start that I think might be appropriate to kick things off. Although there are so many questions that come out of all of your presentations, but Julia Mueller, how do you relate? Your study is contemporary, but how do you relate as you see, and maybe for the first time, or you and Aaron Sanfold have been in contact, so maybe this is not new to you, but how do you relate to the images, the context, the language that's used to tell the story of that murderous in the headlines, starting with the terminology, murderous in the headlines? Um, yeah, well, I think um, something interesting research that I didn't do for this project, um, but I actually did uh, during my study abroad kind of tangentially to this um, was about uh, older newspaper representations of um, women who both perpetrated crime and were the victims of crime. Um, and I think that it, it is interesting because it has uh, changed, but whenever, because of, I, I mean, I think that it's still some in some instances the case here today, but 
because of the kind of societal expectation that women were not aggressive and uh, not violent, uh, that whenever a woman was the perpetrator of a crime, it would be massively sensationalized. So I think that does relate to what Aaron was talking about, um, because uh, you know you hear murderer a lot, you don't hear murderess, and so obviously that gets into kind of the things that we're trying to sway away from today of you know <laughs> leveling the playing field even for hostess versus ho host and murderess versus murderer we want everyone to be equal but um but it, that was very much the case of whenever um a woman was a victim of a crime um if it was a um particularly uh gory crime um, or if she was a perpetrator of a crime that would be really sensationalized it would appear in the headlines um, but uh, as a side note if it was um, if it was a sexual crime or a violative crime um, then it would be kind of the actual details of what had happened or how the woman was victimized would be more hidden down in the inverted pyramid of, um, of um, the story. And, and Aaron Sandfold, when you were doing this primary research with the newspapers, was that something that jumped out to you, the way that women, and in particular, the woman that you were studying, was characterized vis-a-vis -vis language? Oh, definitely. And I touch it on, um, in my thesis paper, there was one particular article I was looking at, and I think the word woman was used like 23 times, and 17 of those was directly referring to Belgunis herself. Um, and, you know, we say in literature, you know, you want to vary, vary your word choice and stuff, but that was a very intentional use of the word woman and kind of like making her other and separating her out and kind of distancing the writer and the audience from this person who at the very first part of the coverage, when the fire was just reported on, they didn't know about her past or really have much suspicions. And so she was portrayed as the widow Gunness, um, who you know was this poor woman who was protecting her children in the fire. And very quickly it turned into uh, the butcher of Laporte, the, murder, the mistress of murder farm, the ogress of Indiana, and very, very like colorful descriptors of language as the narrative changed about her. Um, and I found that in a couple of the other case studies I was looking at is they really, and it was, the time is also kind of coming out of yellow journalism. So there was a real big push of like sensationalism and really just the wild theories they came up with what was happening were hilarious. And we look back and you're like, how, no, Alcum's Razor guys, this is just, she did it. It's not a Chicago gang, but uh, yeah, it's, it was really interesting to see the language choices. That's, I think the first thing that drew me to reading these newspaper articles was the language being used. So, Lara, you and I have talked about going back and forth on questions, and also all of the panelists should feel free to participate in the questions for each other. Yes. Well, thank you, Peter. You are just um, jumping right in and following smoothly along. So it's... Um, these are fascinating projects. I've been just kind of drawn in and um, areas that you know, just there's a lot of um, interesting material, but I'm really curious for um, really all three of you have mentioned uh, different challenges that you've had in some aspects of your projects. But if um, I'd be, I would be very curious for, for each of you to answer a little bit about um, how, how you overcome some of those challenges. Yeah, well, that's good. Let's go through the list. Zach DeMars, would you like to start? What what would you characterize as a serious challenge for the research? And uh, did you succeed or fail? Yeah, um, so I think the challenges that we faced are, in our reporting was a lot of what uh, a reporter on a historical event will typically face. So you're dealing with people who maybe don't quite remember what they were talking about. There was one instance where the key character um, uh, in a story, her name had been spelled wrong in a lot of different newspapers, so we weren't even dealing with uh, quite the right person. Um, and for those sorts of things, um, and we talked to a lot of different people who had different narratives. So um, 
they didn't quite remember the facts the same. We don't know if the FBI came. Did they raid a school? Did they raid a house? Was the FBI ever in Roseburg, Oregon? We didn't really know. Um, and so a really useful thing for that was going to a definitive source, and that was the FBI itself. Um, we found more definitive answers from government documents and newspaper articles uh, than we could from um, historical folks uh, or people who had been uh, there at the time. So kind of focusing, using, using the fact, factual documents for facts and then using characters uh, for memories and for color and for narrative elements, but not so much for the facts was kind of how we um, could, could suss out the, the story a little bit better. And, the, and you really must at this point share with the audience what your roommates said to you when you were corresponding with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah, at that time, I was the only one in the apartment who got any mail, and uh, it was all from the FBI. So they were a little concerned as to why I was getting so much mail from the FBI, but uh, it's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and, and Julia Mueller, uh, the same question. What, what type of resistance did you encounter in your research and how did you overcome it? Um, well, I, I talked about this a little bit. I mean, there was pushback when I sent the survey about people who disagreed that, you know, what I was suggesting was the case. But I think something that was interesting to me was um, quite a few people were um, critical of the wording of the survey itself, um, which I kind of disagree with because um, I for example, one of the questions was um, uh, share, an a share an example of a story that you believe treated women fairly or unfairly, if applicable, <laughs> um, which I think gives some room for either saying yes or saying no or being negative or being positive. Um, but uh, a couple different people, m chiefly men, if I may add, um, said that uh, I was unfairly suggesting that women were treated unfairly, that I was trying to confirm a bias. Um, I mean, I disagree with that because I think that I, I left the questions open-ended enough. Um, but I mean, that was, and also that was the intent of the research was to propose that there are some lacks and see if there are. Um, but I think that was my main pushback is um, there were, I think, um, four or five respondents who just disagreed and felt that the survey was completely biased and completely um, flawed in the, in the wording of it. Uh, so they were critiquing my language as I was critiquing theirs. <laughs> and, the, and to overcome that, you, you just ignored it? No, um, I think I think that's a fair point. Um, <laughs> so I there's a, I dedicated a section of that uh, to that in my in my thesis paper um, because I think that is an interesting perspective that um, that five of the eighty eight people would have such strong objections to that and um, implications and meaning of that perhaps to be discussed in another project. But I still think that it's uh, interesting and. Um, definitely not completely invalid uh, concern on their part and something to consider. So to, con to continue uh, Lara Fernandez's uh, question down the list here, Aaron Sanfold, uh, what, what resistance did you have aside from the fact that your main character no longer is alive and how did you overcome it? <laughs> Um, so for me, it's, as an English major and doing kind of literary research, uh, it's a lot more of a personal problems that I encountered. Um, the, the story is so huge and it's so interesting. It's very hard to narrow it down. Like I said, that was a quick and dirty bell story. There's so much more behind this woman and little nuances of fact that you want to include because they do, you know, matter. Uh, they create this whole, um, but, you know, so narrowing focus was a really big, uh, Big struggle but like Zach was mentioning when you're dealing with historical narratives and what my paper kind of really turned into is there are no true narratives we're always inventing narrative uh, even if you think you're doing a, you know the truest nonfiction you're still creating the narrative you're still writing a story um, and so it was really it came I had a refocus because I was trying to solve the case I wanted to solve the murders and I wanted to find Bell, and I had to you know rethink about you know no I'm talking about the storytelling not the, the story itself so, so as I mentioned, and I'm sure it's true for the entire audience, it, all of these presentations are so intriguing and they they generate questions. And I'm, while you're right there, I'm just curious of one thing, this uh, Lillian de la Torre book separated by decades, the two editions, is the text the same? 
Yes, yes, the text is the same. It's totally her 1955 version, which was considered like the first like true telling of her story. It, she actually went back to Laporte and interviewed uh, people who are still alive and remembered Belle, the grandchildren of the people, people who remember the fire. So she's one of the, the people that really created the baseline foundation of what we have for historical evidence for the case. Um, and so all the podcasts I read, any books published afterwards are all directly influenced by her work. Um, which is interesting to kind of pull from because you can see her influence in the narratives a lot. And, I, and on we go to you, Alexander Haar. What did you encounter as a problem for your research and, and how did you overcome it? Uh, it's probably a lot of the same with Aaron, uh, just trying to deal with so much material, especially with archival research. Um, so going into the collections, it was just um, trying to determine, I mean, learn as much as I could about the Rajneesh. And there's so much there. Um, and there's so much more that like you can learn that trying to find like, I guess a, a research path per se, like find out what is the most important aspect, what is like essential uh, was pretty difficult. And um, part of that was also intention. Um, the Rajneesh aren't like a straightforward, like this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to do a group. Um, it's not always clear what their intentions were behind their actions and why why they did the things they did, honestly. So that can be incredibly challenging. So uh, depending on what you think we should do next, uh, Laura, I think it would be intriguing to get questions from our presenters to each other. I can only imagine that there are some that might be uh, more intriguing than ours. So do any of you wish to query your colleagues? If not, I've got endless questions, I guarantee. And I have one more too, I'm curious about. I had a question for Aaron. Please. So um, recently I feel like there's been like almost this new w resurgence of serial killers, um, like especially with like a new Ted Bundy series on Netflix or something. Um, so I was wondering, how do you see that on like, do you see like women being portrayed in the same way or like coming up in the same way as men serial killers? I have beef with this. I will, I'll stay, I'm going to keep this short. Um, so my, my thing is, especially Ted Bundy is this, his own little box entity that you can shove off to the side. Um, because I think he's just really sensationalized and he's so famous in our kind of meta culture, like now. Um, I highly recommend the Amazon Prime uh, documentary series on Ted Bundy. If you are going to watch something, it's from the female perspectives and his victims. Um, and it doesn't cover, you know, his stories, which the two Netflix ones, I think, really takes a weird perspective and gives him a lot more agency than he deserves. Um, so I think with that Amazon Prime one, they are really pushing the narrative to t tell women's stories in these things. And I think that's been a, a, an issue in the past. When serial killers are talked about, they are generally male, their victims are generally young women. And so the narrative gets kind of set up from the get-go because we have this kind of familiarity with the storytelling. Um, so I think the push in like, even this the last three to four years has really been to push the narratives to talk about the women, even as victims and tell the victim stories, as well as, you know, the other challenges, acknowledging the historical challenges women and other minorities have faced when dealing with the criminal justice system. That answers. <laughs> sure. Are there questions from from panelists to each other, from presenters to each other? Then it's to you, Laura. Oh, great! I I am just fascinated with everything that you all are sharing, and especially the different types of research, having historical versus doing current um, surveys and interviews, and the different topics that you've delved into so deeply. I'm curious where you want to go with this from here. Is this, um, you know, these topics that you've dug into, are you now like inspired to, con to dig deeper and continue on in those various topics? Or do you have somewhere else other than the research symposium that you want to share this newly found information or are you like excited to do research in something else now? I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you. We probably just have a, a minute or two from each yeah, of you. Well, I'll, I'll answer for them. Alexander Haar is going to move to Pune, India, where he's going to join the remnants of the Rashnish 
group. And uh, Aaron Sandvold is moving, in fact, to, to LaPorte, Indiana. In LaPorte, Indiana, she's going to get a job with the local newspaper just to pay her bills while she firmly and finally establishes whether or not the, the uh, perpetrator was Bell and if Bell in fact died at the farmhouse, which is probably today a Costco. And <laughs> Julia Mueller is going to devote her career to cleaning up the language of newspapers across the United States and around the world. However, she's going to find that she needs to reorient her goals as newspapers, one after another, go out of business and it no longer is an issue. Zach DeMars is moving to Rostov-on-Dom in Russia, where he is going to become a fourth grade teacher and struggle as he starts in September and knows only how to say one more vodka, please, in Russian. So if that's not correct, and I am a news reporter, so it probably is. Zach, do you want to start with uh, your answer to Lara's questions? Yeah, well, that's pretty close to the plan. Um, but aside from that, um, like I mentioned, the class uh, that I worked on this project with, uh, we have a, a several hundred page manuscript now that's in front of a few publishers. Um, this is my Zoom credibility bookcase that you put in the back of Zoom meetings to make yourself look more credible. And I'm hoping one day that the manuscript will end up uh, in published form on that bookcase. But um, aside from other research, um, this is a very different kind of reporting than I've ever done before. It's uh, much more complex and a lot deeper than the kind of, you know, breaking news or investigative reporting that I've done previously. So I'm really excited about the idea of kind of this more narrative focused journalism um and deeper journalism than just uh, a headline that you see on cable news and um that we can kind of extract a more uh more a thematic element than just a, a breaking news story so i'm excited about doing more stories and more um you know in-depth dives uh, into historical and, and personal social events uh like this rather than just the breaking news type things yay go go Julia Mueller. Um, well, I was uh, excited to do this research because um, I kind of at every point in my four years here that I've had to do a larger project, it's been something kind of related to this, like related to language and specific nuance or specifically related to women in language. Um, so I did a, a similar thing uh, when I was in the Kid Creative Writing Program talking about um, uh, women's stories in creative writing. And because I like uh, all kinds of writing. I think um, I'm just really interested in um, thinking critically about language use um, because, you know, language is the thing that we all use all the time. We're obligated to use it, to participate in anything. Um, and because of that, we have to like learn it and start to use it very quickly. Um, and you know, especially in things like journalism, we're turning it out quickly. And so there's, um, I think that there's kind of this lack of conscientious language use just because we have to use it and we have to not really think about it. And so we very quickly adopt um, traditional ways of speaking or writing, um, kind of ar archaic ways of speaking and don't really think about it. But I, I think that whenever you, we have the opportunity to examine you know, a metaphor and be like, well, this was based on this stereotype about some specific group of people um, that that can be so beneficial in changing language. So, you know, whether it's by changing style guides and making them more comprehensive or just, you know, teaching creative writers differently, um, I think that that can be really beneficial to helping, you know, push social change forward. So I'm not totally sure where I'll take this research, but I have been kind of looking at this the whole time through and I, I'm going to continue, I think, with this theme and whatever next I do. Um, and I think that even though I've been focusing on, um, you know, the representation of women, um, that a lot of these things, I, I forgot to say even in, um, in my presentation, but the idea of like having more instructive, um, instructive language guides for uh, women also applies to other racial groups and religious groups. 
um, and the LGBT community. And I think that that kind of more expansive and explanatory stuff can be applied, um, you know, more broadly than this too. Yeah, and it's intriguing. One of the reasons I know that all of your presentations are working, at least from my point of view, is that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm connecting personally with with each of them. For example, I had a friend who was a Rajneeshi, and she moved to the Oregon community after she she resigned her job as a United Airlines flight attendant, and she was a stewardess. That's what her title was at that time when she resigned the job. And, 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 and I'm also connected to Laporte here, and I want to know the answer to the question here that we're asking everyone, but my wife's mother was born in Laporte and we made a pilgrimage back to Laporte. So all the time you've been talking about Laporte, I'm getting these images of Laporte in a way so different than obviously a visit to a mother's hometown. But it's your turn. No. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this research has meant a lot to me. I was originally going to be doing my English thesis on uh, Charles Dickens' Bleak House. So this was a very different turn uh, for me. And I was, I really have to credit my mentor for just being as enthused as I was when I found those newspaper articles. And she's like, you can write a project on that. And I was like, wait, I can talk about murder. People, people will let me talk about true crime. Um, and so I think just knowing that I could take this interest and treat it academically and have it be conveyed in this way was really important to me. And this project actually is going to be part of a, a larger digital project that's currently being built for another class. And so that's going to be, um, it's a site called Omeka, which does digital exhibits. And so uh, there'll be a ton more images, a lot more information, a lot more comparisons um, that will be available through the UO blogs uh, site. Uh, and I do continue to keep building that up and just kind of just contributing. I have a few other murderesses that uh, need to have their debuts and be known. Um, but for like academics myself, um, I do plan on going to uh, graduate school and doing MLIS for library sciences programs. Um, I did fall in love with archives while I was doing this, uh, did a lot of digging through newspapers and historical papers and it was just, it was fascinating. and. Uh, being a digital humanities minor, I also have like a really big push to um, promote accessibility and making these things accessible to general public outside of academic walls. And so allowing these kind of databases and allowing these kind of things to just be more open and accessible to the general public. I think all of these kind of projects, you know, could benefit by going into the public and not being kept behind academic walls, which I think is really great that we went virtual because now we can actually really promote a lot of the stuff to the public and it's not just, you know, tucked away and you don't have to go someplace to go see it. And, and it doesn't get lost. It, it doesn't get lost. It doesn't burn down in a fire in Laporte. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, on to you, Alexander Haar. Um, so I started this project as a term paper, as I mentioned in the video, and I think at this point, I think I've had enough of Rajneesh Parham. I think it's an incredibly interesting context and incredibly interesting story. And there's a lot more to learn, but um, I'm keeping it as our moving forward. I'm probably, it's a, it's gonna be part of my thesis project uh, for the Clark Honors College, but I'm not sure in what capacity it will be. Um, probably more of like base foundational, like a jumping off point rather than um, the main point. Um, but I, yeah, as I mentioned in my video, I'm interested in like studying other groups that use sensationalism, um, possibly the NRA or um, possibly just directly chronicling either Trump or John, Boris Johnson's like action interactions with the media. Um, but no more Rajdeesh Parham, I just had, had too much of it. Um, and there's one other point I was going to say. Um, is I, I would love to come away with a prescriptive list of the recommendations for the media to avoid these interactions in the future. Um, that's the ideal goal um, in the end, uh, but we'll see if we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, and of course the, that list could be inverted and then used by someone who wished guidance for sensationalism, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, and particularly because I, I mean, the base of this project was really, I felt the media, um, I feel like the media has been off like 
in coverage wise. And I think that that's a big thing and it's gonna be continue to grow at, in importance as we proceed into the future. So I think that at least I'll be sticking with media for sure. Good. Laura, do you have more questions for the group? I actually don't have a question at the moment, but I had a comment that Erin kind of inspired talking about um, being happy that these are recorded sessions. And I just wanted to share my involvement in the symposium is, um, I well, for many reasons, I'm just blown away with what students are doing, but I also run a program, it's called the Summer Academy to Inspire Learning. We're working with middle and high school students, getting them inspired to uh, pursue college. And these recorded sessions I will be using. So I want you to know these are going to be used um, to inspire young youth in that, um, and I'm particularly excited about this, the journalism field, because often youth think that research is just, you know, lab coats and, and um, science based. So I really commend you all for um, working as hard as you have and following your passions, but also being willing to put this into a presentation and record it because I will be sharing you. So um, I just wanted to say thank you. And um, I have learned a lot today. So that, that was my comments. Thank you for that, uh, Laura Fernandez. And, and so bef before we say goodbye, or as we say goodbye, in the context of uh, these comments about the virtual nature of this and the fact that it's recorded, I think it would be intriguing for us to share how we feel having spent this spring term separated and engaged in this radical change in a school that we, we I, th I think all would agree, one of its assets, one of the assets of the society that we all create at the University of Oregon is one of intimacy. The, the campus itself is relatively small, and we, from my observation, pride ourselves on engaging with each other directly and intimately. And so I'll start, if you all play along with this, and that is, I have found in large part, I think, because of my sordid history as a radio talk show host, that it's worked quite well for me to interact with the students in the one class I'm teaching this term, which has 150 plus students in it. And th that is a class that just by the nature of an hour and 20 minutes, everybody can't participate in when it's a live in-person class. You just can't get through that many comments. And it's easy to sit in the back room and uh, doodle or whatever else you, you might want to do in the back of the room. So as I searched for something positive to come out of this, this uh, radically changed environment, that's one thing that has worked. Using the talk show techniques, pulling out of the student body in the classroom, their reactions via the various tools on Canvas has in fact worked very well. And no matter what the university decides, I'm going to continue to use some of these tools in my classes because they have proved to be productive. That's my rationalization for hanging out in a tie and no shoes on. Your turn, Zach. Yeah, well, um, you know, this is, cer it's certainly not how I expected my last term of, uh, you know, undergrad to look uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, but I think it, it has given me a chance to see what I've appreciated most about the rest of undergrad that was more normal. Um, and it has given me the, the chance to appreciate that kind of communal feeling, like, like you mentioned, um, of, of being on campus and being in in-person in classes. Um, and I think it's given me more of an appreciation for the moments that um, I do get to have with people like this. Um, and, you know, with, with the, the limited classes that I do have kind of face-to-face -face via, via Zoom and, and that sort of thing. So I really find that I have a greater appreciation for those moments 
um, than when I had, you know, a hundred things of, of that nature every single day on campus. So I've definitely appreciated what, uh, what was lost and what, um, what, what moments are left now. And I really, I commend the folks at the, the undergraduate research symposium for turning what was already a massive and challenging uh, event to coordinate, I can only imagine, and, and flipping it online in a matter of weeks was really, um, really fantastic experience. So, yeah, for sure, and and there's no question we we have lost a lot, but it's it is magic to see you here, and it's a drag not to be having a coffee, Julia. Um, well, I think if I can bring it back to language use, um, we've been saying, uh, you know, like the hot button term is um, social distancing, but I think it's important to remember that we're not really social distancing, we're physical distancing, um, but we have still had so much opportunity to connect socially because of technology and because of things like this and because of Zoom classes. So um, I agree with Zach, this is not um, how I imagined my final term of college to be. And I do wish I was with everyone and could you know, be face to face, but I'm glad that you know, this didn't happen and we were completely cut off from people. And so I'm trying to appreciate things like this and um, other ways that we are able to continue to socially connect even if we're physical distanced. And yeah, I just echo what Zach said about, um, you know, this has made me really appreciate all of the connection I've been able to have throughout the last four years. Um, so it's, it's a bummer, but not all that bad. <laughs> Indeed, Erin? I miss the library. I'm just going to throw that out there immediately. I miss the library. Um, but I think kind of echoing everyone's comments so far, it has been really intriguing to kind of see, you know, what benefits we're getting out of this and what, you know, we can take moving forward and, you know, all the different opportunities people are going to have now knowing that we can actually kind of have these systems in place and do these kind of things in the first place. Um, and for me, uh, being home all day makes this one a lot more happy. She's been... Yeah annoying us this whole time. Uh, and so I think just, yeah, having, being in your own space and kind of learning to live with yourself has also been a really interesting kind of uh, way to get to know yourself through this time. For sure. Alexander. Um, I think it's also pretty interesting just being stuck at home. Uh, I have some roommates. They just, they've been just sitting here while I've been on my <laughs> Zoom call. So it's just, an interesting change of pace, I guess, and interesting change of space. Uh, I never realized how much like space, like physical space actually mattered to me, especially when it comes to like studying. I just, it's so hard to focus at home for me. Um, but yeah, I just really miss like, just like the EMU especially, um, just like the big study areas and just some like a space to like study, like to do a specific purpose, I guess, rather than just exist. Well, it's just been lovely to spend the time with you all and to hear about your work. Thank you, Laura Fernandez, for orchestrating this. Alexander Haar, Aaron Sandfold, Julia Muller, and Zach DeMars. It is uh, an example of what motivates me to go down to campus. At, yeah, I remember that. that time. I used to go down the campus. And, and uh, congratulations to all of you as you continue to pursue your dreams and for participating in this undergraduate research symposium. For Laura Fernandez and the whole crew, I'm Peter Lawfer, and we will see you on the radio. Woohoo!